Hi everyone. Sorry for the um, starting the class late. There was a I, ha I had an important meeting at this time. Sorry about that. So welcome to lecture sixteen. So we're gonna today talk about pre-trained language model. We're gonna continue from what we where we left off in the last lecture, and then also we'll also talk about tools that people use. So today's outline. So I'll give you a few announcements and then we'll go through a few slides from last lecture for the recap on transfer learning and language model for pre-training. And we're gonna dive into BERT. We're gonna really look into details. Although if you have read the paper already, you will see that the experimental setup is quite simple if you know what transformer is already. So you don't probably need a lot of time to go over the model itself, but we're gonna spend a few, at least a few tens of minutes at the end and learn how to use BERT on Hugging Face this library called Transformers. This will be very important for the rest of the lecture, less of the class in this semester for you to complete assignment four and also the final project. Announcements. So number one, assignment three will be due today at 11 p.m. And remember that you have no penalty late days they can be used for any assignment, by the way. So I think there was some confusion. If have, you have already used them, then you will have 10% penalty for each late day. So be careful not to submit the assignment late. And I'm, go I'm going to release assignment four on Wednesday and it's going to be due in two weeks, which is May 26th. And next Monday, May 17th, we're gonna give an introduction and tutorial on the final project. And also we're gonna have uh, some time for Q and A, Q So it's, the schedule is a bit complicated. So be careful and also try to look up the schedule on the website because it might be confusing that assignment four will be due after us, the final project is out. So. So be careful about that. Until now, I think all the assignments were sequential, but uh, because we are running out of time, I'm going to introduce your final project before the assignment four is due. And the final project will have two components. Number one is presentation. We're, go we're gonna use the gather town. So, uh, I think many of you have don't know what this is. So actually I'm gonna show you that soon after um, when we are going into the, right before we go, actually right before we go into the tutorial on Hugging Faces Transformers. And we're gonna, basically you can think of this as a virtual, I'll say conference. So we're gonna have a conference on your final project and you will need to prepare your posters for this, but in general, I don't want you to put too much time on actually preparing the poster, poster itself. In many cases, the poster will consist of your diagrams from the report. So, uh, so basically be, I would say very um, efficient how you prepare these things. At the end, you'll be graded on the report and also your presentation, but not too much weight will be on the the presentation poster, poster itself. So please try to put more time on reports. But also please spend your time on preparing the presentation itself because we're gonna be going around. So, um, so the TAs and I will be going around and then we will ask you what, the, what your project is about. And you're gonna give a short presentation and we're gonna give you uh, a few questions and you will answer them. It will be a, a short conversation between you and us. 
and we will grade based on that and with the report. So uh, more things will be clear in the uh, uh, the final project PDF that we're gonna hand out next Monday. But we're gonna use the June seventh and June 9th classes for this real time. So hopefully you will prepare for that. And you're gonna submit a report. It will be four to eight page report and without including references. And also the length is not strictly enforced. So I'm not trying to really penalize any report that's shorter than four pages or longer than eight pages. But please um, be, of course, um, you know, reasonable. It would be very bad if you submit like a 20 page report without a good reason or on the other hand, like submit a one page report, which probably will not have enough content for you to get full credits. So four to eight is probably recommended in general. And this report will be due on June 16th, Wednesday. That's actually during the finals week. So you can think of this as final exam in some sense. So do you have any question? And as always, if you have any question, you can ask during the class or please put the question on the GitHub discussions and I'll try to answer them as soon as possible. Okay. Now let's get into recapping what we discussed in the last lecture on Monday because the Wednesday was the holiday, right? Hopefully you had a great time. So we, first talked about transfer learning and how it compares against supervised learning. So in supervised learning case, we discussed that what this does is we want to fit in a series of training examples and we want the model to start from randomly initialized weights to reach the some parameters that will get you good numbers on your training examples. And of course, if, if it didn't overfit, then it will do well on the, the test examples. And in the last lecture, I described this in a more mathematical manner that you're basically doing um, MLE, which is maximum likelihood estimation. And how you do that is you first define your probabilistic model these days it will be consisting of a lot of parameters in a neural network. And you want to maximize its probability on training data. So, which means you want to find, find the, the parameter set theta that maximizes the probability of your training data given the input. So your output, your output probability given the input. Right. And basically this probability of course model has some uh, component theta that defines the model itself. And then in the process of doing this, we basically want to uh, assume that the every training instance is independent, which means we can consider this to be equivalent to multiplication of all training data probabilities. And if you and this is, of course, because of, because of the, the, the characteristics of the, the monotonic increasing, uh, monotonically increasing characteristic of log. What we can say also is that this is also equivalent to argmax theta of 
pi of no, I'm in where is it? Eraser, yeah. It's log of uh, the all the probabilities, and then you can just take the the prop the product out of the log, and this becomes summation, and and you basically just compute the log probability of y i given x i. So this is the very traditional way of approaching supervised learning and we call it maximum likelihood estimation. But in transfer learning, we discussed that the core difference is that we want to maximize the probability of y given the training data x, but then not only that, but also we want to consider the data that's coming from another task so that we can do better on this target task. So that's the really core difference that we are, we want to be aware of when we are discussing transfer learning, that we're not just trying to maximize the probability of the output given the current input in the training data, but you're also utilizing the training data from another task. And how can we utilize training data from another task in an effective way? So one of the most, most popular methods for this is called fine tuning. So we also discussed this. In the traditional supervised learning, what we're doing is that suppose we have a task, then Basically, in this task, we start from theta being some, um, some um, I would say, randomly initialized. Although I write this with uh, z the zero because it basically doesn't contain any information. It's very random, entropy-wise, especially. But then we basically want to tune this model. Actually, I'll. So theta is starting from the null or in randomly initialized parameters. And we, we train with SGD to reach theta one with some data. So this is how you would do the supervised learning, right? But in, trend, uh, in fine tuning, what we do is we have two tasks. And in the first task, you fine tune the model with stochastic, no, not fine tune, you train the model with stochastic gradient descent on this task one to obtain the parameters. And then when you, when you say you transfer learn from task one to task two, you do not start from randomly initialized parameters, but you start from theta one. And then this gets tuned to some theta two. And this is exactly the difference between fine tuning and supervised learning because your starting point is theta one instead of randomly initialized parameters. And really the the, the the assumption here is that it's much better, you will get to much better optimum if you start from theta one instead of the randomly initialized parameters because the theta one contains some information that's useful for task two. In this case, we're assuming that task one and task two has same models, but in many cases, it doesn't really have to be. What really matters is that your what you're transferring has to be contained in the the target task model. So what does this mean? So for instance, 
suppose that you have a model for task one and let's say that uh, it has in input here. And then let's say this has like a three modules. And then some neural network layers basically. And then this gets to the target value Y and then you train this entire thing. And for the task two, you might only want to bring a few layers of from the task one. So maybe you just want to crop this first two layers and then just bring this and then you start from the same parameters as in the layers from task one, but because you don't have any information about the third layer, you will need to start from random initialized values for the task two. So in this case, then this has been transferred, but this has not been um, transferred, but it's basically just um, entirely new model in the task two. Okay. So that's like a really popular way of transfer learning the model. You don't have to really transfer everything from one test to the another. You just transfer what you think is important and you might also want to build on top of those transferred parameters, either after or before those. So of course, in this case, it's, it's perfectly fine to actually add another model. All right, and then this is also not transferred from task one, but randomly initialized from the beginning. So this kind of, uh, you can play around with these kind of transfer and try to make the model better. And here, of course, we're assuming that the task one is similar enough or useful enough so that what's getting transferred will, will be useful for completing target two, and task two, sorry. So we discussed that this was very important in image classification in early, early days, but in NLP, I mean, no, oh, I'm sorry, I'll repeat that. So in, in vision, image classification was really useful for as a pre-training step for any other vision related target task. So in here, in this case, image classification in vision was T1. And then you basically transfer this knowledge to other tasks like detection or segmentation, etc. Image classification was proven to be very useful for transfer learning. But the problem is that in NLP, text classification was not as useful as image classification. And it turns out that actually uh, image classification equivalent in NLP was more of a language model. And we found this out relatively, relatively recently in 2017. And the first work that really utilized that was called ELMA. And we discussed that ELMA was purely LSTM based language model. So it doesn't have any attention. And ELMA was used as the contextualized embedding of the target task model. So in this case, you use ELMA at the very first layer of the model so that you get the word embeddings, but these word embeddings are not local, but they are contextualized which means their content depends on what's around them. And then, but the target task model is already, it's it's same as the model that you would use without the ELMO. So for instance, in supervised case, fully supervised case, you have some model, you have some uh, input sentence, And then you basically have some 
embedding matrix that you embed each word into some embedding. And then you have some, your core model here, right? And then you get the output. If this was a supervised case, then in the Elmo paradigm, you have the same input sentence, but instead of using the embedding that's localized and word specific, you just use Elmo here. The beauty was that the output of Elmo and the output of the embedding model is same. So at least you can easily utilize Elmo if you have your target model, model already built for the target task. The rest is the same, exactly same. So these are same. And the paper show that the improvement was at least like um, three to five percent in many tasks. And the there was a clear limitation of LSTMs. That's why people now started to replace LSTMs with transformer. And one of the first work was GPT one that I think has drawn less attention compared to GPT-2 or 3 or BERT, but there was such thing as GPT-1 for your reference. And I think we discussed this last lecture that uh, GPT-1 was using the transformers decoder for the language model. And one of the core contribution of the paper was that instead of considering each input, because in, in NLP problem, you might have several inputs instead of considering each input independently, GPT concatenate all of them and just consider it as one input. And that gives us a lot of, a lot of simplicity and also power, modeling power that allows us to model really complex things. And that exactly really motivated the development of BERT, which we'll be talking about in more details in today's lecture. So, and in, I think last slide of last lecture, we discussed that this basically marks the beginning of the era of large pre-trained language models. And today we're gonna to talk details about BERT. And when we go, uh, when we get into next week's lectures, actually not next week, but probably, um, probably Wednesday lecture and also um, week after next week, we're going to be covering a few large preterm language models that have been proposed recently and that are worth mentioning. Starting from BERT though. Okay, so let's first discuss what's the difference between BERT and Transformer. So I hope that you all recall what Transformer was. So as a really quick recap, Transformer has an encoder that was, Transformer was originally built for machine translation. You're mapping a sentence in one language to another sentence in another language. And so suppose you have input as an English and then you have encoder here. And then this gets used by decoder with attention. And then you spit out French or German or other languages. And this was transformer. So what I wanted to mention is that transformer had two modules. One is encoder and the other is decoder. And recall that encoder is just several layers of attention. And decoder is also layers of attention, but this also has attachment to the encoder's outputs. So decoder has in each layer of decoder in transformer, it has two sub layers of attention. One attention is the self attention within the decoder side. And the second layer of attention is the attention with respect to the encoder's output. It's important to recall this because BERT only uses transformers encoder. That's really the one key difference. So, so this is important because people sometimes get confused. BERT doesn't use the transform the decoder at all. So BERT cannot generate a sentence. It's not 
it doesn't have generation capability. It only has a encoding capability. That's why BERT wasn't tested on machine translation task or language model task because simply it cannot do that. And there are also several other differences. Number one is that BERT uses position embedding as opposed to sinusoidal encoding that transformer uses. BERT has a larger model size BERT, because it's only using encoder, it has a different training objective and it's called mask language model. And also BERT has, um, I would say, larger training environment as well. So let's get into these, but there's some core differences, but um, to be honest, as I told you, it's very, um, relatively, I would say, very simple differences too. So it's very easy to explain what the differences are and why they did this way. Uh, but the implication is quite big because um, we know what BERT did to the community as of now. So first of all, position embedding. So transformer uses sinusoidal encoder. So do you remember this? So did we draw a sinusoidal graph and then just basically assign the value for each position. So maybe position zero is here, position one is here, and then you basically do this for all the positions. Of course, if you have only one sinusoidal graph, then you will have only one value per word, but each word embedding needs to have several values, not just one value. So you basically draw several different sinusoidal graphs with different phase and also different period. So maybe another graph might have some longer phase and maybe shifted too, right? But let's, let's say it's not shifted, but maybe something like that. Oh, my bad. Maybe second, this, so this is dimension one, but maybe the second dimension is something like this, right? And maybe third dimension is something like this. So the real benefit of this was that you can theoretically handle arbitrary length of the input. But in practice, people found that there is no really, uh, really, um, there is no really uh, empirical guarantee that this will work when the length will be super long. And after all, if it, it cannot really handle the long length sentence, then it just makes sense for us to limit the, uh, the maximum length. And if it's longer than that, then maybe we should just find another way to take, uh, to really resolve it. So BERT was exactly, um, BERT is probably not the first, but at least compared to transformer, it was exactly um, tackling this point that actually the GPT was also, uh, if I remember correctly, also using positioning embedding. The fact that instead of having this random sinusoidal graphs, why not just consider the each position's embedding as uh, fully trainable parameters? That means, let's say we have a input length of 128 then we're gonna have just 128 by, and then also let's say the word embedding size is 512, then we're gonna just have we're gonna just have a one large matrix that's length uh 128 by length and 512 by depth, and then each is a vector, right? This is a one one large matrix that you train when you that the, 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 the this is a one large matrix that is trainable during training time. Unlike the sinusoidal embedding, which is fixed given the what each dimension's graph has, what each dimension's graph is phase and the period is, but in if you do, if you consider this as a position embedding, then you can just fully train this, just like basically um, word embedding. But then, 
difference is that in the word embedding, your words embedding depends on what the word is. But in position embedding, your embedding depends on the position, right? So that was really one core difference. And how you then, how you actually co combine this position embedding with word embedding? Very simple, you just add them. And that was also a really interesting thing too. I mean, actually that was the, also the case in the transformer too, but um, you don't really have to really think about concatenating them, which increases the size of the embedding, but adding will makes it um, scalable, even if you can, you have several types of embedding. So in fact, BERT has one more type of embedding, which is called token type embedding, which is basically, which basically exists because not every word is an input. Your input is, for instance, if you're doing question answering, you have two inputs, right? You have a, one input is your context or document, and the other input is question. But you might want to differentiate be between these two. So what BERT does is that they, you concatenate these two as a one sequence. So you, for instance, you have a context word, and then you have a question word. And you want to indicate that this is a context by saying that this is a type one token. So it's something like you have a label of one, but for question, this is type two. And then, wait. So I'm not sure I'm remembering this really correctly, but um, really the point is that you want to have a, another indicator that's separating between the sequence one and sequence two. We're gonna see this in the, um, also the Hugging Face, Hugging Face tutorial, but uh, consider that you also have a token type embedding, which is indicating what the what, what is the use case of each token. And of course you will also have uh, some special tokens too, right? Not on, I'm sorry. This basically have a some separator token, and you also have a some special token at the beginning too. I'll use actually bracket. And these these special tokens allow us to really distinguish between context and question or two inputs, which is especially important because we're gonna consider this entire sequence as one input. And BERT also has larger model size. So remember that transformer was using like six layers, right? For on the encoder and decoder. So if you actually consider both, then you can think of this as 12 layers. But BERT large uses 24 layers, so it's deeper. It requires a lot more computations. And BERT was not trained on the same objective as Transformer. In Transformer, the training objective was to generate the target sentence given the input sentence or source sentence. And we can do this because transformer has decoder, but BERT doesn't have decoder. It only has its encoder. So what can we train on this? In fact, BERT proposes mask language model, which basically means you just bring a random document from Wikipedia and you hide some words. So you basically have a document and you have like words, right? These like the documents and the words, and maybe there's an image. Of course, you will ignore images in BERT. And then what you do is you just uh, mask some words like this. You mask some words randomly. That was um, the, the important thing in BERT that there is no really very smart way of what words to mask. You just mark, mask these words randomly. And it was one of, um, um, the criticisms that have been made after BERT, because if you hide words like really common words, like is, are, 
UI. These words are really easy to guess. So then in that case, then if you try to guess these words, it's too easy. Maybe Bert is not learning super useful things. So there were follow up works that trying to mask harder words or more informative words. But we'll, we're going to talk about that later. But for now, Bert, you can think of Bert is masking these words randomly. If I remember correctly, um, something like 15% of the words. And then once you have masked these words, then the model, it will try to guess what that word is. And how does that work? So let's say you have, uh, you have this transformer encoder. So this is a transformer encoder. And then you put the words in it. And then you hide some word, like here. And use, use special token called mask. And then you just continue put continue putting the next words. So the important thing is that the masked word can be inferred not only looking at the at the words that come before the masked words, but also looking at the words that happen after that. So it's bi-directional. And that's another important point, another difference, key difference from Elma or GPT, which was unidirectional when they were being modeled. Although Elma was bi-directional, but they were trained independently. So it, it's not that you can consider both, both side contexts at the same time. So, and then you will have your embeddings here, some embeddings, right? And you basically try to use this embedding to guess the original word or maximize the logit for the original word compared to other words logits, just like how you would do with language models or generation. But um, it's a bit different from language model, right? Because it's, it's not really language model. Language model is by definition unidirectional and has to be able to generate language, but this is not able to generate language so to be more exact, this should be really called closed test. It's, there is a word for it, but people, uh, I think, didn't use that word because the purpose of this is really to mimic the language model, not to do the closed test, right? And also it's fancier too, right? The, the term is fancier. If you call it mask language model, then closed test. But there is, this is a key difference. And it turns out that the mask language model is very, very efficient to train because you can just mask these words and then try to guess them at the same time. Unlike the transformer decoder, where you have to rebuild your model for every, you, you have to re rebuild your decoder for every generated word. And it becomes very inefficient to train those. So mask language model has a lot of benefits compared to transformer decoder training, of course, if you're, you don't have to generate anything. And in the bird case, you don't have to, because your purpose is pre-training. And lastly, um, some details about bird, tra bird training. So BERT, because it it's using position encoding or position embedding, I'm sorry, it has to have some fixed length of the input size, otherwise, if you have trained for say 512 length, but then you see longer sentence, then that what that means is then you have this matrix that's 512. This is position embedding. But then if you, during inference time, you see something that's like 700 words, you basically don't have the embeddings for this, right? Because you have never seen, you have never used these embeddings during training time. So it's important that BERT has fixed input length during training time so that we know how many words we can handle during test time. And we, which also means that if the length goes above 512, then you cannot do anything about it from the BERT side. So you have to chunk it 
and do something smart about it, depending on the, what the target task is. In many cases, um, like for instance, if it's text classification, then maybe you just want to just look at the first five, 12 words and then just ignore the rest of the words. That will be the easiest baseline. If you want to do it a bit better then maybe you want to use a sliding window, which means maybe you look at the first five, 12 words and also you look at the, the last five, 12 words and make an inference, then you'll have a two scores, right? The, the classification scores coming from the first five, 12 words and the classification scores coming from the, the last five, 12 words, and then just maybe ensemble them, just merge them. And then you can try to guess what the, the, the really final classification score is. If it's longer than 1000 words, then maybe you want to do really the sliding windows, then you will have a several, you will apply your bird several times on the long document. Whichever it is, the point is that you cannot, you cannot expect the model to handle above 512 and you will have to find out some smart way of utilizing it in that, that depends on your target task. And that's exactly the, um, the difference between this and transformer. And also the bird best batch size is very large. It's going up to 512. And we're gonna go, can, come back to this, but this was a really the important discovery, I think that Bert has made that batch size is very important, if the, especially if the input size is very large. I mean, the training data is very large. And this was actually contrary to the popular belief held by very many people back then. Especially that's because actually Jan LeCun, I think many of you know who he is. He's the inventor of CNN, Convolution Neural Network, and also the father of deep learning. But um, he actually said that there is no reason to make the batch size larger than 32. So many people thought that there is no reason really to make it any larger than 32. And it starts to overfit after 32. The, the, the reason was because I think um, back then the size of the labeled data or supervi super, supervision data was not larger than like, you know, 10 million or 100 million. I mean, it was not on the scale of billions. It was in the scale of millions and maybe in the order of millions then best size of 32 was enough. But then it turns out that one of the really core contributions or the discovery was that increasing the batch size is extremely important. It's actually really important that um, at least at the time of BERT, the difference between using batch size of say 16 and 512 was really big. Although also, but also I wanna mention that, so in the BERT, they were saying that, okay, model size is important because we went from 16 six layers to 24 layers with a lot of parameters. Now we're going up to 0 0.3 million, but also batch size is important. And also of course, input data and uh, training data is important. In this case, they're using, um, I forgot to mention here, but then they're using Wikipedia English plus, um, what was it? Uh, was well, something like some book corpus. And Wikipedia English has something like 3 billion tokens and this has something like 1 billion tokens. So it's all together is 4 billion tokens. And now we see that it's really large. So there were three components, right? Um, uh, models, so first of all, model size and then batch size, uh, no, model size, training data size, and batch size. So Bert was saying that all of these three is important. And it turns out that in the recent study, what the most important thing in among these three were actually was, can you guess that? It was actually model size. So the, this report last year from OpenAI was saying that, okay, all of these three are important, that's true, but 
if we have to choose one and if we have to really increase one of them, the really important factor is the model size. We just have to increase that really large to make this model better. And that was, uh, that actually was the, the driving force between developing GPT-3, which was really large. They knew that with this experiment, model size is the, the most important thing. We just want to increase that super large. With respect to model size, the training data and batch size is not super important. Um, so of course they're both important though. I'm not saying they're not important, I'm just saying it's not relatively important. And also um, the um, training steps is not also as, as important as model size or any other factors. Um, so that's really important thing, but in BERT, um, they were saying that all these three are important. Um, and back then they were using 64 TPU chips, which is approximately equivalent to one DGX station that has 16 V100 v GPUs. Um, I'm not sure how much this is, but this was something like, um, um, like $500K dollars. So it, um, it's not cheap, like half a million dollars to purchase this one thing. And you need this to train this model. So it's very large model and large batch size. And they were training this, I think on like four days. Um, but the really important thing is that you need a high network bandwidth because you are transferring a lot of information between GPUs, which means that if you transfer this information through CPU, it will be very slow. So you have, you have like several GPUs, right? You have several GPUs and there you can choose, uh, you can choose to transfer this information through CPU, which means they come from the GPU to the RAM and then go back, go, go to another GPU. And this is very slow. So what we have to create, what we have to use is actually intra GPU communication, which is in NVIDIA, they call NVLink. I think you have heard of it. So basically you are communicating between GPUs. And if you're a hardcore gamer, then you know what NVLink is too, because NVLink allows you to actually really enjoy super large, I would say um, like 4K, 8K monitor. You can play like super high performance game on these like super large pixels, number of pixels, like 4K or 8K. And although they may, might have, may have been initially developed for gaming experiences, but nowadays we know that these are the critical, the crucial technology behind deep learning, especially when we are doing multi-server, multi-computer training. Okay, so actually I'm kind of running out of time for the um, hugging face tutorial, but I'll try to go over a few things with hugging face. So the, the, the introduction of BERT was quite shocking to the community, mainly because it was different from Elmo in that in Elmo, you still needed to design your own model for the target task. It's not that Elmo is doing that, that for you. Elmo is just enabling you to further increase your target model's uh, performance, like three to 4%. So that was really good for many researchers because it's not replacing their models. They're, it's helping their models. But the, the world changes when BERT was introduced because BERT doesn't help existing model, BERT replaces it. Which means then from the researcher's perspective, it's not like I'm going to use this to improve my model this model just does better than mine. And it was not super good thing for many researchers who were really interested in model designs for relatively well-defined tasks like classification or question answering. And turns out that actually um, because of BERT, everyone could now build super accurate model without any difficulty. And when I'm saying super accurate, I'm talking about human, uh, above human performance and really with few lines of code 
and anyone can do that really easily. It's basically democrat democratized the NLP research. And adding a value to BERT has become harder because of the scale and also because of its capability that it's doing really well. That's researchers' perspective. But then if you think about more about applied researchers, so that was for the that was that was the pure researchers' perspective. But if you think about the applied researchers or engineers, this makes a lot of things super easy because in this case, you're not really worried about the model models. Um, I would say you're not really being worried about, you're not trying to submit a paper and then get uh, your novelty recognized, but you're trying to build something. You're trying to build an application that's useful. And BERT is making you to build that really easily. And on top of that, the Hugging Face is probably the most popular library that actually people use to implement BERT. It's very easy to use that it's so easy to use that um, I think um, you'll now see uh, your assignment four will be based on hugging face. And although you are creating much more accurate model, you will feel that this assignment is much easier than the previous assignments that I made you to actually build transformer LSTM yourself. And now you might ask why, why do we, did you, why, why did I actually make you do that? I mean, because we're now all using BERT. And that's because exactly because actually, um, probably now on after this class, you'll never have a chance to work on LSTMs probably, I think in many cases, um, or really delve into, um, you will not have much chance del delving into Transformer because um, the, these libraries is already doing it for you. So hopefully that was a, you know, it's a good, good opportunity to really delve into that because it's really hard to do that when you're doing research, when you're trying to use these state of the art models. And of, of course, delving into these details will help you to really make innovations from, from the ground. So hopefully the, um, your experiences with assignment one, two, three, one, one, one and two were worthy and so it's good right because i think assignment three which is due today and assignment four that's due in two weeks probably are easier than one and two and hopefully you can put more time on the final project so let's spend a few minutes on how we can use hugging face transformers So I'm gonna go into this website and show you. Okay, so Wait, um, screen sharing doesn't work. There you go. You see it? Let me know if you don't see this collab screen. Um, so if you go into this link, now you will see a Transformers website. It's called um, Transformers because it's actually centered around Transformer. And basically this is a, um, you can think of this as the documentation for the, 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 the library and installing the library is quite simple. So you can just go through that. I, I highly recommend going through QuickTour 
because it's very easy to use. Um, so, but I think other things, there are a lot of, it, it, there are a lot of changes actually since when I used this a lot last time. So um, looks like there are really more um, simple things. I mean, there are more simplifications happening. Um, for instance, looks like you can create a classifier directly and then just classify. So this is not really, um, I, I would say, um, I mean, this is basically where the, the library is going because library is not just for educational purpose, right? It's also, it's actually for the real production purpose. So they're trying to make a lot of things really easy. But when, when I'm teaching, it makes, it's, it's, it's easier for me to actually abstract out some these some these application oriented details. So um, I'm gonna talk about how you can use BERT. So not these um, other things, but, um, where is it? So let's go into, um, yeah, it's like changing every time, but I think, so here it is. So we'll, we'll see how, how you can fine tune the bird that was pre-trained on the language model. So. Look at this. Um, you first basically um, you import BERT. You, you basically import BERT for sequence classification from this library called Transformers, and then you initialize this model from pre-trained, which means you're uh, you have BERT model, but then you initialize those parameters with the pre-trained weights. We discuss how the transforming works with the pre-training and fine-tuning. So this is the model that you obtain, and then you change this to train mode and you just um, create an optimizer, right? And this is like just details for the optimizer. But what's important is that you import a tokenizer. We, up to now we were using very simple tokenizer called like space-based tokenizer, right? But then the tokenizer uh, in the, in BERT, you have to use the same tokenizer that was used for BERT so that it's exactly in the same environment. So you bring the tokenizer from the same model name. And then suppose that you have a text batch. You have two cases. One, one sentence is I love Pixar and second sentence is I don't care for Pixars. Then you use this tokenizer and just put this as an input. And then basically you will get the encoding that corresponds to this text batch. Encoding here means that you will get the, um, the token IDs. And this token IDs will be basically the input for the BERT and th that's why they call it um, input IDs. Attention mask is just for, um, um, because you're gonna have a variable length input but then you only want to consider the tokens. I mean, but you have a variable length tokens but then you have fixed input length. So suppose that your BERT has 512 length but then your input at that time is length 10. Then the other 512 tokens should be ignored your, during your uh, uh, training and inference time, right? So uh, that's why you want to mask this out and that's what the attention mask is used for. And then you basically have a uh, training labels and then you use your model and put your inputs and uh, attention mask and labels for, um, of course here in this case, it's either zero or one if you're doing binary classification and use this model for the outputs. And then you just have a loss for this. You just train this loss backward with optimizer step and that's it. You just made a classifier with this. So now you see how this is so simple. You, you, pick, you can basically create a classifier with like how many lines, like one, two, I don't know, like 20 lines. And all you have to provide in your case, if you want to create a, your um, classifier that fits your needs, is just basically just alter this batch into your training data. Of course, you might want to give more training data than two. You only have two training data points here, but then maybe you can give like 100 or 1000 training data. And then you'll also need to provide labels. This can be, if you have two classes, then, um, and you have two data points, that's why your first 
data point has one, which means it's positive review. And your second data point has zero, which means a negative review. Of course, you can just give a very long list of labels if you have a very long list of um, training data points. And it will take like five to 10 minutes, but real strength here is that that model will be the state of the art compared to all the models that have been proposed be before BERT. And that was the really the, um, the point that BERT was making. We're not just making this simple, but it's super good. And just, you can use this for any NLP application you want to. Okay, so I think uh, uh, it's 3.51. So I'm gonna end here. Um, I think we didn't have enough time because I was a bit late in today's lecture, sorry for that. We're gonna delve into how we can use this library in Wednesday, on Wednesday's class with more details. And basically we're gonna try to use the this library to do the same thing that we did for assignment one and two, which is classification, text level classification and token level classification. And you will exactly see that how easy this can do, this can be and also how exact this can be. That's exactly um, the point that will be exactly the point of lecture, next lecture on Wednesday. So please stay tuned. See you on Wednesday. Thank you.